Dear participants, dear colleagues, we are starting now. Benoît Mandelbrot is a man of many parts. In particular, he is very effective in bringing an appreciation to the general public and young people. Must we be reminded that at the beginning of 1970s, he defined and named fractals, which described a multitude of objects found in nature whose indented forms appeared at smaller and smaller scales of observation to have similar shapes. Professor Mandelbrot called this phenomenon self-similarity. Thus, this new theory, popularized in the book The Fractal Geometry of Nature, fulfilled the dreams of a number of mathematicians who were working to the best of their ability to bring mathematics to the general public. Indeed, in one way, the mathematics were subtle and gave birth to new deep theoretical problems. But in another way, they allowed a number of immediate examples to be understood uh, and visualized. Clouds, topography of large towns, turbulence, etc. And finally, one can show fractals in color thanks to computer-generated simulation, and they are beautiful. I would like you to promise to visit, if you have not already done so, the exhibition Fractal Art, Beauty and Mathematics, which is in the Congress Center and also in the Condé Duque Museum. Also, I recommend to visit in the Condé Duque Museum the exhibition Experiencing Mathematics, launching through UNESCO with the help of IMU and ICMI. I would like also to mention that Benoît Mandelbrot has been the honorary president of the ICM 2006 Benoît Mandelbrot Fractal Art Contest, and that the winners of this contest are in the exhibition on fractal art in this building at third floor. This conference and the cultural exhibitions around mathematics reflect the engagement of our Spanish colleagues, the IMU, and more generally the worldwide community in bringing mathematical culture closer to the general public. Certainly, fractals have an important place there. Thank you, Ma Professor Mandelbrot for we have learned that it is necessary to break the mirror of appearances and that many complicated objects without apparent form are in fact very beautiful. They are fractals. Thank you very much for this lovely introduction. Uh, I must indeed say that this exhibit, in which I had no part except to um, accept to be the chairman of it, is uh, something uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, this after yesterday, we walked by the other place in town where it is being shown, and there was a long queue of people going to see a mathematical exhibit. It's uh, rather unusual to put it mildly. The, the fact that this exhibit is not purely mathematical is also very important because it combines the mathematics with its very strong structure and the taste, the genius of many uh, artists. Well, for me, it has been an extraordinary fulfilling uh, situation to uh, witness this phenomenon. And uh, what I would like today 
is uh, first of all to thank the committee to invite me for inviting me for this lecture and then to present to you some of the very many facets of fractals so as to give you a feeling for the extraordinary variety they represent and also their unity. Now to begin, here is an alternative title, the rough and the smooth. Now let us think, it's very difficult, but let us think to time very long ago when primitive man or woman was looking at the world, surrounding world. How many simple, smooth shapes does one see? Very few. One sees the moon, the iris, and the pupil of the eye. One sees a, when a stone is thrown in a lake, the circles that create. Well, maybe a few more. Five examples, ten examples. Well, it's not important. Very few examples. Everything else was very rough. The trees, the clouds, the roads, the bark of the trees, everything was very irregular. Now, how, how did humanity react to this uh, division between rough and the smooth? Anybody who writes a, a story knows that the story does not have much bite unless there is a fight between good and evil or between one or another force of nature. In this case, it's not a fight. It's a coexistence between the rough and the smooth. Because the smooth was taken very seriously in every culture, developed, and then became geometry, then became mathematics, then became science. But the basic fact is that everything was smooth except for perhaps a few corners. So what happened to the rough? Was the rough neglected? Of course not. So I'm going to argue very shortly that the rough has been a very strong inspiration to many artists from time immemorial. When sometimes people tell, uh, ask me who has invented fractals, who has discovered fractals, my first reaction is, it's not me. In fact, it's nobody in the last 100 years or 200 years. It's somebody very, very long ago who first made drawings in which nature was simplified in either the Euclidean way or the fractal way. And so the, uh, the definition of fractals, I will come to it very shortly. Now, I have this subtitle here, fractals, pure mathematics, etc. Let me take these points one after the other. Now, in pure mathematics, uh, fractals uh, had a very important role uh, around, well, around 1900. They were called monsters. But that's besides the point. They were not viewed as being in themselves of particular interest. And when I came up in 1970 or so, with a systematic study of them, uh, people asked me, well, how many interesting things for us mathematicians are you bringing? Well, I know how to wait. It's one of my virtues. And uh, uh, I say, wait. Now, it's uh, quite uh, extraordinary that three of the Fields medals in recent years have been given to people, to people who proved some conjectures of mine. One is the conjecture of the fourth third for Brian Motion, which Wendelin Werner proved with Odin Schramm and Lawler. And another one is a conjecture about the equivalence of two definitions of the Mandelbrot set, which have been called MAC, and Yokoz and McMullen were rewarded in large part for this work. So in pure mathematics, this return of the eye, the return of picture, the return of the introduction of a reestablishment rather of the old relation between the hand, the eye, and the mind has been very fruitful. Not in proving anything, because the picture never proves anything, but to giving new ideas. And I will develop that a little bit later. Natural sciences, well, you'll see very shortly what it, what's about. It's uh, examples of very simple nature, of very crude nature, of very immediate nature. And then culture, 
Well, culture, in a sense, that uh, culture just is a word for everything that man has created, whether it's uh, great music or great painting or the stock market. These are not uh, laws of nature. These are phenomena which man has created but does not quite understand. And so uh, I will try to show you how the fractals enter in this context. And last uh, but not least, in fact, perhaps foremost, the fact that um, humans of every kind, of every age, as a matter of fact, uh, are attracted by fractals, it's not because I'm such a brilliant educator. I'm not. I'm completely unskilled. I started being interested in education very late in my life when students came to me and said how beautiful fractals are and how much they make them want to learn about mathematics. So there was a hidden door somewhere, the door that in a way humanity prefers the rough to the smooth. And uh, to finish my, my summary, that is not very surprising because if you think again of primitive man, uh, the world in which the man, man has evolved has been the world in which roughness was the rule. Smoothness was an exception, exception of particular simplicity and loveliness, but still an exception. Now, let's look at this picture. It's very boring, very, very boring. It's just a piece of land. And it's a, ge a geologist friend of mine who took this picture. Now, he told me something uh, very in important, that in his school, the professors always tell the students, if you go in the field and take pictures, always put an element of scale so you know how big it is. For example, put, put a camera cap or put yourself. Well, so put, look at that and look at it again. Well, it's the same picture. It was cheating. It was not a camera cap. It was, in fact, a hula loop with a piece of a garbage bag on it. So what was for geologists a matter of police, policed by the professor who tells the students always put an element of scale, can be turned around, not as a question of how to say order, do it right, but the question, why is it right? Why is it that if you forget to put an element of scale here, you can get completely mistaken and confuse a little pile of rocks with a big mountain. So this is kind of, a, how to say, folklore, which I made very big use of, because it turns out that almost every field has some kind of folklore of this sort somewhere. And when this is the case, the, 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 the system is the same at all scales, and that is what I call fractal. Now, so the first observation uh, is that say, scale invariance is common in nature. In nature and in culture, I may add immediately, this had been long known, but nobody could measure it and could not be taken account of. So now we come to something else, which is one of the big, big uh, turning points of every science. Uh, basically, the sciences arose out of our sensations, because otherwise, how do we know the world? We know the world not because by intuition, but by just touching it or being hit by it. So the world, you, we see light, we see sound, we see hotness, we see roughness. But think of it. Light and sound have been mastered long ago, around 1800. And so the color, color is measured by a frequency, and the pitch is measured.